The episode begins with Sari and her companions discovering two statues. They inform her that these are the first king, the founder of Osmarco, and his wife, Queen Nefertiti. The endless power struggles for the throne had exhausted the monster race, so they unified under this great hero and his queen, who carried a sword to protect his back. Sari recognizes them from the history books she has read and realizes that this era was the best in the kingdom. However, she was unaware of the existence of these statues in the palace, as access to this area is strictly limited to royal birthdays, coronations, and major consecration events, commemorating the founding of Osmarco. Not only the royal members and nobles from the subordinate states attend, but even the common people of Osmarco gather in the palace for a grand celebration. Sari then asks about the king, as she hasn't seen him all day. They inform her that he is preparing his extravagant attire for the grand consecration ceremony. Usually, the kings wear the attire of the first king, and one day she will also wear the attire of the first queen. Upon hearing this, Sari rushes to the king's chamber to see him. Her companions try to stop her, as it is forbidden to approach the king while he dresses, and he would be angry if she spies on him. However, Sari refuses to wait because she wants to see him while he prepares for the ceremony. She enters the king's chamber while he is dressed in his luxurious attire for the grand consecration ceremony, looking incredibly elegant like a true hero. Sari is greatly impressed by his elegance and happily compliments him, which angers the king. He orders everyone except Sari to leave the room, and they all exit, leaving only Sari and the king alone. The king remains shy and moves his tail as a sign of embarrassment. Sari joyfully tells him how wonderful he looks. As they converse, they hear the sound of strong winds. The winds are becoming stronger, and the storm-ridden atmosphere outside will eventually push the infected air from the world. The king believes that tonight will be an inspiring night, as he loses his monstrous form and powers. He appears in human form, which is his limit in this human form. If anyone sees him like this, it will create many problems, and no one will recognize him as the king of monsters. Sari approaches him to reassure him, bringing the bread that her mother, Amet, made for him. She wanted him to share it with her as they have a long night ahead. However, the king is filled with fear because he cannot survive here without his strength as the king of monsters. In this fragile and weakened human form, he can do nothing but hold his breath in the darkness. But Sari is confident that the monsters will accept him in this form, just as they accepted her in her human form. He doesn't have to hide again. Therefore, he must cultivate faith and patience. He asked her to hold his hands because he believed they were not normal, as they had been cold and trembling the night before the previous great consecration. She explained to him that it happened because he was anxious about appearing at the consecration ceremony, but it didn't happen during the previous great consecration alone. He had always been plagued by this feeling before facing his people, fully aware of their scrutinizing gazes. He feared that someone would see him in his true form as an empty, unqualified king, devoid of everything, but now he had her by his side. His fingers no longer grew cold or trembled, and even if she wasn't with him tomorrow, he could still feel her presence in his heart. He was always under her protection. The next day, the bells of consecration rang, and the king and Sari woke up in their human forms. He was shocked and didn't know what to do. Then people started gathering in the palace, witnessing the rare sight of a blue sky for the first time. Sari informed the king that he wouldn't be able to return to his monstrous form because the contaminated air had been dispelled the previous night. This was the only thought she could entertain, as they were afraid of him remaining in his human form permanently. The king said that the polluted air would eventually return, and when that happened, his magic would restore him to his natural form. Sari asked him to hide only until then, but he didn't agree. Then they went to the festival, and everyone was searching for the king. He wasn't in his chamber, the audience hall, or the grand hall. The counselor became extremely angry, and Sari was also missing. Something had obviously happened. The bell that rings for the great consecration chimes twelve times at the exact hour when their first king declared this kingdom. No king had ever been late, not even by a second. They couldn't allow this to be the first time since many of the subjects were already eagerly awaiting the arrival of their majesty. The counselor ordered his men to search for the king everywhere in the palace, but they did everything they could, yet found no trace of him. Suddenly, Seth appeared and asked them to search underground in the inner altar room, a place usually forbidden. It was the best place for contemplation before an immensely important ceremony. Perhaps the king had simply lost track of time there. The counselor agreed to search there as it was an emergency, and he would bear all responsibility. They all went to that room, knocking on its door and calling out to him, but they had no other choice but to force it open. 
however, they found no sign of him there either, so they returned. Meanwhile, the king and Sari were in a secret passage unknown to anyone else. The king used this passage to let the sacrifices escape and then stained the ground with blood, making it seem like he had killed them, so that no one would know that he hadn't actually slain them. However, he never imagined he would use it for himself. They exited the palace, but the king remained in his human form. When they reached the secret passage, Sari was startled to see guards waiting in front of it. At that moment, she shouted loudly. The commander approached her and asked if his majesty the king was with her or not. Sari became flustered and nervous in her speech and told him that she had been searching for him since morning but hadn't found him yet. She believed he wasn't there, and the commander looked at her as if he didn't believe her. Then the guards took him and went back the way they came. Sari returned to King Leo and told him that the place was now secure, but he mentioned that they were still in danger because the place was filled with guards. After that, they moved to another location because the guards had searched for them in that place and believed they wouldn't come back. The king was very exhausted and lost control of his nerves. He fainted and fell onto Sari. His heartbeats were rapid, and he began to transform back into his monster form, although it was an inconspicuous transformation but he wouldn't be able to go back to the palace now because the bell could start ringing at any moment. If he could regain his monster form again, he wouldn't have enough time to put on his royal attire since the bell only rings twelve times. At that moment, Sari told him that it was not impossible, and they needed to find a way for the king to transform quickly. The king was unable to do anything, his fear evident in his eyes, and he appeared confused and tense. Sari took the king's hand and told him that he was a great king, not because of his strength, his magnificent armor, or a golden crown, but because he loved his people and wanted to protect them in any way he could. He didn't want to harm or kill anyone, he wished for the well-being, safety, and peace of all. The king was deeply moved by her words, but at that moment, he turned around because he heard someone approaching. Sari quickly tried to delay them from entering the room, hoping that the king could transform back into his monster form. She opened the door and found a person in authority with some guards behind him. This authority figure was surprised because it was the first time he met the girl Sari face to face. Sari asked him who he was, and the person introduced himself as Seth, a judge and the first member of the constitutional court. Sari was amazed that a judge had come to this place since everyone in the palace was searching for the king. Seth informed her that he had returned to this room because he felt a magical presence there. He possessed a sixth sense. Sari told him that the king wanted to concentrate before the ceremony so he could address the people. Therefore, they needed to leave the place now. But Seth didn't believe Sari's words entirely and expressed his concern for the king's well-being, suggesting that he should check on him personally. Seth approached Sari closer and told her to open the door immediately, warning that he would use force if necessary. But Sari told him that she would never open the door. At that moment, Seth gestured to the guards to open the door with force, as he didn't want to handle a woman who could potentially become the future queen with roughness or cold treatment. However, due to the urgency of the situation, he had to take drastic measures. The guards approached Sari and tried to grab her, but she bit one of the guards' hands and quickly went to the door to prevent them from opening it. Just as they were about to open the door, the king appeared in his monster form with his full power, his red eyes illuminating the entire place. At that moment, Sari was overjoyed because the king could now transform back and resume his duties. Seth approached him, acknowledging that he had anticipated the king's presence in that place but wondered what he had been doing all that time. Just then, the bell for the ceremony rang. The king replied in an extraordinary manner, stating that he didn't need to wear his new robe or golden crown, as he was a king regardless of his appearance. His rule was not defined by clothing, but by his words and actions. Now we shift to the outside, where everyone is waiting for the majestic king. The bell was ringing again, and people wondered why the king hadn't appeared yet. They were anxious, eagerly anticipating his arrival. On the other hand, we see the advisor, who is extremely nervous because the king still hadn't arrived. He instructed his servants to stop the bell and cancel the ceremony. However, at that moment, the king finally arrived in a divine aircraft, capturing everyone's attention and filling their hearts with delight. It was the great and magnificent King Leo. The king stands before the large crowd, and everyone is in awe. However, to their surprise, he is not wearing his luxurious attire. The people wonder why he has deviated from the revered traditions of this grand occasion, and they ponder among themselves the reason behind his appearance. Suddenly, the king shouts loudly and begins his magnificent speech. Today, we bid farewell to the shield of our founding king, not because we diminish the respect for our traditions. 
this kingdom is the legacy of our first king, and it is my duty to defend and strengthen it. However, I cannot accomplish that by merely following in the footsteps of my ancestors. Strict adherence to the past will leave nothing but a relic, and it will make us narrow-minded, clinging to tribalism. There must be an intention for permanent change. That is the true meaning of honoring traditions. Unless we change, unless we progress, we will be unable to carve a path forward. The king points with his hand and says, Follow me. I will clear the thorns and build a path for you to walk. It will lead us to the future we should strive for. With this, the king concludes his magnificent speech. The entire crowd cheers with love and great joy. Sarai, deeply moved by the king's majesty, congratulates her servant on this beautiful speech and wishes she could be by the king's side. Afterward, we see the king's advisor congratulating him on the astounding speech. However, he wonders why the king did not inform them about these bold plans beforehand. The king replies, if I had told you, you would have opposed it. Suddenly, Sarai arrives, filled with joy, and embraces him. The king continues, this idea came to my mind because of something Sarai told me. It is incumbent upon me to do more than just show elegance to my people. Sarai is surprised by Anubis praising her and thinks he might be testing her once again. However, he assures her that her tests are now over. Later, the king gathers with his advisors, including Sarai, and tells them that her tests have concluded. Sarai is puzzled because all she did was summon Benu and host the duke. Anubis informs her that she will take her place as the queen's representative, but he requests that she fulfill all the public duties of a queen without any mishaps. If she succeeds without tarnishing the king's reputation, she will be recognized as a full queen during the upcoming grand ceremony. The king's perception changes upon hearing this, as he realizes it is a challenging test. Nevertheless, Sarai's public presence as the kingdom's representative will inevitably require revealing her existence to the people, and she will face difficulties, such as protests from various parties. Failure to perform her royal duties and damaging the reputation of his majesty the king will result in her being returned to Yuan, the human kingdom, shocking Sarai. And yet, there is a way for you to stay in this country. You can refuse to become the queen's representative. In that case, I will ask his majesty the king to marry an official spouse, and you can be his loyal companion, like a pet to the king. The king hits the table with his hand, objecting to this statement, but he suppresses his anger and says to himself that this is a big problem for Sari, and all he can do is accept her heartfelt answer. Anubis thinks to himself that this is also a big gamble for him, and now what will you do, mischievous one? Afterwards, Sari goes to sit alone and thinks about her fate. If she accepts the position of the queen's representative and fails to fulfill her duties as expected, she won't even be allowed to live in this world. If she gives up the role of the queen, she can at least stay here. Suddenly, Bino comes to her and asks her about the reason for her confusion. He tells her to aspire to become the queen because this country is like a stagnant pond, and you will never progress unless you create ripples and stir things up. Sari asks him how, and he slaps her face hard and asks if it hurts. She surprises him by saying that she feels no pain at all because her wings are too small. Then he tells her that she no longer needs to be a miserable sacrifice. So lift your head up and say, I am the only one who can make his majesty a great king. At that moment, Sari remembers the king telling her that she is the only woman he wants. She feels hopeful, and then Bino transforms into a giant phoenix. We see the king walking with his advisor and being surprised by Sari and her phoenix. Suddenly, Sari jumps down and says that the king wants only her, and she embraces his majesty the king. Anubis is astonished and angered by this. Sari tells the king that she will do it and become the best queen's representative she can be, so she asks him to have faith in her and let her stay with him. The king tells her that he was waiting for this answer, as her previous tests were for her alone, and all he could do was clamp his teeth and observe. The king shares the responsibility with his chosen wife, whether she is a representative or not. This is also a test for him, and he will always be with her. Sari informs him that from now on, they will share the same burden. And thus, the tenth episode ends. Stay tuned for the next episode with exciting events. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell to receive all the latest updates.